Yeah, probably. Excellent. Okay. Uh, uh, well, welcome everyone to the community. There's my conference. running order. Thank you very much for being here. Uh, we are now pleased to welcome Rich Sands and Simon Phipps to talk to us about building frequently asked questions documents. So, thank you very much for being here. Hello. Hello. Hi, I'm Simon, and this is my friend Rich. Um, we used to work. This is Simon. Just so <coughs> we're all clear. Um, we used to work at Sun Microsystems, and um, one of the things we, we you could you look back at your career and you work out what your career highlights were. One of them was making the Java platform GPL, and uh, one of the little-known facts about that is that wouldn't have happened without Rich writing an FAQ. It would have been absolutely impossible for it to, to, to happen. And so we're here to explain to you why that was. So I don't know if you can imagine this situation. Uh, some developers just thinking about their, their project and deciding that, um, you know, we've got this, this, this piece of software here. Uh, it's, a, you know, it's, it's a web framework. Um, and we would really like to just release it to all developers everywhere. And we hate patents, so let's, let's add a defensive patent grant along with the copyright license. What could possibly go wrong if you release something under a really straightforward, permissive open source license and just add a, uh, a, a patent, defensive patent clause in it? Can't imagine what could. Could you imagine anything going wrong with doing that? No, can't imagine anything going wrong with that. So um, well, what do you do when that happens? What do you do when it turns out? Now, so why did this, this happen at Facebook, in case you weren't aware? Facebook released uh, pretty much all of their open source software under a very straightforward OSI-approved license, and they added a defensive patent grant to it. And the defensive patent grant kind of favored Facebook a little more than the community. <laughs> and, um, uh, and the reason that happened, as far as I can work out, is because internally, the folks at Facebook had different views on what the community was, was interested in, on what their business direct directions were, on what their messaging about their products were. They, they weren't actually internally aligned and consistent. And then they did a thing, and it turned out that they weren't ready for it. It all went horribly wrong, and they didn't know what their plan was. And uh, we've, we've, we've been in that place. We've been in that place. So you can't see these. But uh, so the Java platform, I said in my keynote this morning, the Java platform was a great thing. The Java platform um, was the first real big commercial project that used uh, an unrestricted source code license that you could just pick the source code up and do what you want with it. In 1995, Sun released all of Java, source code and all, put it on the internet. The license was not a free software license because it didn't let you use it for commercial purposes. But this was really bold. No one had ever done this in quite that way before. And the market picked up Java and ran with it. And, and they were able to make it into a huge market phenomenon well before the term open source was defined, well before free software was in the popular commercial mind, only three years after the internet was really widely popular in the, amongst the general public. Problem was, um, the way it was licensed wasn't free software, and anybody who cared about free software and then open source said, hey, that's not open source. And so we, we, we actually stimulated Richard Stallman into the creative act, and he actually wrote an article about our product, and you'd think that would be great, wouldn't you? It was, <laughs> it, it was called Free But Shackled, The Java Trap. Um, and, and then our, our chief executive was, uh, was, was he, you know, he was a, a, an old-style... BSD guy, and he didn't have much time for this GPL thing, and he was an old star Unix guy, and he didn't have much time for this upstart Linux thing, and, and, and he was an old style tell it like you see it guy, and so he said those things in public quite often. <laughs> and so coming into the role of chief open source officer, everybody hated us, and if we tried to release Java as open source, we were pretty sure that on day one we would get rocks thrown at us from all direction. So the, the question then came of what do you do about that? And the short answer to that question is, well, you, you write an FAQ. Now, you don't write an FAQ to answer frequently asked questions. That's a common misunderstanding about <laughs> FAQs. <laughs> Primarily, you write an FAQ to work out what the answers to the questions are 
and to get everybody who ought to have an opinion to agree before you go public. That's why you write an FAQ. And so you write an FAQ to test and refine your strategy and to get everybody, to get your legal counsel, your, your VP of marketing, your VP of engineering, your VP of OEM sales, your, everybody in your company to agree what your strategy is. Uh, it, somebody pointed out to me earlier, this is the old strategy of if nobody will decide, just do it, do it wrong, and they'll all help you fix it. <laughs> so so that's, that's what we're doing here. And by doing this, we created consistent messages, and that led to establishing trust through transparency. Um, if you can stand in front of a FOSDEM audience and answer questions about your uh, considered to be proprietary product and nobody throws anything, then you have got a coherent strategy. And I'm, I'm proud to say that wasn't my first FOSDEM keynote this morning because I did that as well. In 2006, I spoke at FOSDEM and I explained we were making Java open source and everybody cheered. <coughs> and that's all because of him. Um, so, Rich. So, yeah, let's, let's uh, have, stop. The have the thing. Okay. I'm just going to hold it. So, who's the audience for an FAQ like this? Well, a lot of times what companies will do is they'll uh, create different messages for different audiences. They'll have one document for uh, customers, a different, audience, a different document for partners, and another document for developers, and all that sort of thing. But that doesn't work in this case because developers are actually a very tough audience and really understand uh, what's going on with uh, uh, developer initiatives at a pretty deep level. And de uh, developers are also very uh, allergic to uh, spin and to seeing different uh, messages to different people. So you have to focus your message on developers. And uh, what you do is you uh, actually get very transparent. You tell them what the, what the truth is. And amazingly, all of these other audiences, your customers, your partners, the media, the analysts, they all actually love this because you're being a lot more uh, forthcoming, a lot more unvarnished with the message that you're putting out to developers, and so all of these other audiences that are used to getting spin actually get uh, the unvarnished truth, and, and they like it as well. So if you can satisfy developers, you'll satisfy all of the audiences. So don't try to create an FAQ for customers and another FAQ for partners or whatever. Just do the FAQ for developers. Oh. Yes. You're, the, you're the scroll man. Yeah, you've got to pay attention. Just, if only that was a touch screen. The GNU General Oops. Public License is the most popular. Most <laughs> That's a preview of what's to come. <laughs> <laughs> you thought you were just getting us, but you're getting RMS as well. Okay, so what's the most important thing that developers are looking for? They're looking for the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. In a word, they're looking for transparency. So, um, Transparency is actually a difficult thing for corporations because uh, a lot of times uh, the people who are responsible for messaging, marketeers, et cetera, have, have developed a lot of skill at convincing people what they want to convince people of, and it actually works. So transparency is very scary for, uh, for companies, but that's why this actually works. So um, if you if you deliver what uh, developers are are looking for, they will actually uh, cut you a lot of slack. They'll they'll give you the benefit of the doubt, even if they don't like all of the messages that uh, that you're giving them. Oops. Oops. It's coming. Keep on okay. So, you know, in the in the spirit of an FAQ, of course, we've structured our uh, our talk as a series of questions and answers. So, do I have to answer the hard questions as well as the easy ones? Well, yes, you do have to answer the hard questions. And the reason is that nothing is really uh, all that new about developer initiatives. We've got decades of experience with this kind of stuff. And developers know where the traps are, where the, uh, where the difficult uh, questions are. 
and they're going to be expecting answers. So if you can answer those hard questions, you do two things. The first is you actually prove to the developers that you've thought things through and that you know what you're doing. But even more importantly, uh, if you don't answer the hard questions, it's like a, a big red flag. So the developers know what the hard questions are. They're expecting to see the answers. And if you don't answer them, they know you've got something to hide. And they'll be looking for it. And, you know, all of this is going to come out eventually anyway. And they're going to figure it out. They're just not going to trust you. And they're, and they're going to do all the, the pitchforks and, the, and the, uh, the torches and all and the rocks and all that. Um, so you're not going to please all the developers uh, that are part of your community if you're doing something controversial. So what if, what if you don't know the answer to a question? Well, it's very simple. You put the question in the FAQ, and then you say, I don't know. And then you come back and you answer the question later when you do know. But by leaving the question out, then you run into the first problem, not uh, uh, engendering trust. What if they aren't going to like the answers? Well, they, I can promise you that some of them won't like the answers. But don't spin. Put the truth out there, and they'll, you will at least earn their respect and their trust, even if they don't like what you're saying. And that's very important. It's just vital to put even the uncomfortable stuff in the FAQ. And don't try to, don't try to, uh, uh, to hide that. It's okay to put things in the best light. That's not the same as spin. It's okay to, to talk about things in ways that you think people will understand and, and accept, but be sure to put it all in. Well, what happens if they read the, old, the FAQ and they decide, you know what? We're not really into this. We're not going to adopt your technology. Well, at least you know that your strategy is one that your community isn't going to accept. And that gives you two choices. You can either go back and fix it so that it is something that the community accepts. Or if that's not feasible, at least you know and the community knows and there's no surprises. So this can be a very strong signal to go and rethink your strategy if you put the FAQ out and you get the pitchforks and the, and the torches. So here's an example from the open source Java FAQ. Um, so the question is, why didn't you choose a license like BSD or Apache version 2? Well, so that seems like a pretty straightforward question. What, what makes this a hard question? Well, it's a hard question because at the time, there were a lot of large companies who uh, had paid Sun a lot of money to license uh, the, uh, the binary, uh, the runtime for Java. And they looked at the opportunity with Sun open sourcing uh, Java. Well, maybe we can use the open source version and we won't have to take out a, a binary license. Well, um, it didn't really work out that way because Sun thought through what all the different strategic choices were and made a very specific choice that definitely was not popular. Sun opted for a dual license strategy, GPL for the open source, and uh, a uh, binary license that you had to pay for uh, in order to uh, 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 be able to, uh, to, to use Java on these platforms. So um, what happened was this was very unpopular, but it was the truth. and by putting that out there, by putting the real answer out there in this fashion, the uh, community uh, at least uh, understood what, uh, what this was about. Next. So what goes into the FAQ? We've, we've already talked about some of the characteristics, but um, depending upon your particular initiative, you might have some or all of these 
uh, topics such as, uh, uh, but you know, you start from the more uh, general things and you get more more specific. But the whole thing has to hang together as a uh, as a coherent uh, explanation of what you're doing. So if you say one thing in the more general uh, questions and a different thing that doesn't really follow in the more specific, people will look at that and sort of scratch their heads. Um, the general FAQ does not replace the documentation. It doesn't uh, replace a getting started technical FAQ. This is really about why you're doing it, how you're doing it, and what you're hoping to accomplish. Next. So this seems pretty daunting. How do you get started? Uh, well, because it's complicated, you start early and you bring together a cross-functional team. You get all the people who have a stake in uh, this strategy, like the marketeers and the, the lawyers and the salespeople and the engineers and the support people, and you get everyone together with an empowered team that uh, the members of that team can speak for their function and, and, and work together to really uh, figure out the strategic conflicts and work it out in advance uh, through this process. And by doing that, you can engage leadership and then you can gain some concurrence across the whole organization. So who should write the FAQ? Well, you need a great writer. You need someone who's uh, really good at messaging and, and a great team leader. Well, it's your community manager, of course. Um, so by, using a community, by having the community manager really be the, the leader for this, uh, they uh, are much more likely to help the organization create um, a strategy that is going to work for the, the community. And um, it's also a terrific career builder if you're a community manager and want to take on a larger responsibility or get exposure within your company to, uh, to the leadership. So how do we get the leadership on board? Well, this is actually, now that you've uh, draw on the short straw and, and no good deed goes unpunished. Um, so how do you get your leaders to, to really buy into this? Well, it turns out that an FAQ like this is a really difficult leadership test for the top people in your company because that radical transparency that developers expect is something that uh, is going to put them on the spot. Once the strategy is out there, they're going to have to own that strategy. They're going to have to uh, be on board and they're going to have to get the whole organization to work uh, by demanding uh, compromises, disagree and commit, whatever is necessary. Uh, and they'll have to embrace some of these difficult uh, uh, things like tra uh, radical transparency, giving up some control. This is all stuff that does not come natural to leaders. So. Um, if your leadership isn't on board, watch out, and at any rate, you're going to learn a lot about the uh, leadership and the operation of your company just by doing one of these. I'm going to turn this over to you. Oh, I get this one. Lovely. <clears throat> um, so one of, the, uh, one of the challenges you have with any uh, open source activity is uh, everybody wants your legal department to run your strategy for you. And um, when it comes to engaging in this sort of radical transparency, where you actually tell the community truthfully what it is that you're doing, uh, it turns out your legal team may have a few questions for you. Uh, in fact, they will quite possibly think the transparency is just too risky, that the really you can't afford to tell people the truth, and really you should take a leaf out of Oracle's book and just surprise everybody each time you do something. Uh, and, you know, they're right. That radical transparency is legally very risky. Uh, one of the reasons it's very risky is because the, the, uh, the act of discussing the difficult things puts on the record on your email system a set of arguments that are discoverable in a lawsuit. And consequently, those arguments can be brought back and played back during the lawsuit to show that you were not actually as firm as you think you were, as pe people think you were, about your strategy. Uh, this isn't theoretical. This actually happened uh, during the Oracle v. Google lawsuit. I was one of the, uh, I was giving testimony, I was one of, one of the witnesses. And I did have emails brought up out of the discussion about the FAQ 
that, uh, I w where I was asked questions about whether I was telling the truth about my position in court and whether my position was defensible, coherent, sane, and whether I was an idiot. It's great being a witness in court. Um, <laughs> Uh, so so you, are, you are actually creating risks. The question you have to ask yourself is, is, is the price worth paying? And if you are committed to working in an open source community, then the, the answer is yes, that the, it is a price that's worth, worth paying. Because if you don't do this, you simply won't be able to get the network effect that goes with the community, which is the thing you're going into open source in a community to go and get in the first place. You're buying trust at the price of legal risk. Um, and so uh, you, you do have to involve legal. You know, legal language is very precise, and your lawyers will read your FAQ, and they will make sure the wonderful text that you have written is squeaky, precisely clean. And you'll go back to them and you'll tell them that isn't English, and uh, so they'll then write it again. And you'll iterate three or four times to get something that is both legally precise and also readable by somebody with English as a second language, which is actually crucial that you, that you actually achieve that. Uh, we actually had, uh, had that work very well in the case of the Java FAQ. A good example is that question that, we did be that I showed you before. The original version of that question uh, said, uh, why didn't you choose a commercially friendly license like BSD or Apache? And it was not necessary to have that editorial comment in the question. The lawyers caught that. Uh, the marketeers wanted to put that editorial comment in to get people to think <coughs> a certain way. But in the end, the lawyers were absolutely right. So we were, we were actually blessed with really good lawyers uh, at Sun as well. Okay, so then the, the, the other challenge that you have in doing all these things is you may well be operating at a level in your company where you don't have the involvement of the executives who ultimately have got the say on what your company's strategy and messaging is. And it's crucial that you do that. It's crucial that you have executive backing for what you're doing in your coherent strategy. And uh, that's one of the reasons why I believe writing an FAQ in advance of announcement is one of the key things to, to do, because it will force your top-level management to get into the loop, because they will have to approve Press, what is effectively a press statement. And so I, I found that the FAQ was very effective in getting our executive VPs uh, involved in the loop in, in re early on in the process of releasing Java. And we're zipping along because we're running out of time. So this is you. Okay, so zipping along. Um Use an authoring tool with change tracking because if you don't, people will really hate you uh, for having to read a gigantic document over and over. Publish the FAQ close to where your community lives so that they have a pretty good chance of finding it. Um, make it really simple. So just don't do all the fancy JavaScript with uh, expanding and collapsing questions and answers and all that stuff. All it does is, is uh, make it difficult to link to the individual questions. Give all the questions a number so that you don't have to refer to the fifth question in the legal section. You can refer to question 25. Uh, and then finally, uh, evolve the FAQ and um, uh, moderate and publish all of the comments, both uh, pro and con. And that's part of the transparency. It's, it's worth just commenting on that, but that's a crucial technique when you are dealing with a legal department. Because your legal department's very expensive. You don't really want to have them constantly authoring documents. So you get them to write the legal statement. And then the FAQ is the, 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 the discussion of the legal statement. Mm -hmm. And you accumulate answers to the questions the community has got in the FAQ. And then periodically, you get the legal department to fold those back into the official license or the official legal document. And that way, you can remain responsive to your community without having to get your general counsel involved every morning. Oh, you want me next slide? Yeah. So um, we're just, I'm just going to gloss over this one because I really want to show the video. Um, but uh, once you've got this FAQ, it's a terrific source for all the rest of the communicating that you're going to be doing, whether it's writing presentations, training your spokespeople, what have you. Now you've got the answers to all the really hard questions. You know, so if, if the press comes at you with some crazy question, you probably already have the answer already figured out. Okay. And we want to go loud. And we want to... So here's a, I, I have to share with you, this is my 
This is one of my career achievements. You remember we started this process uh, with Richard Stallman writing a, a helpful marketing document about the Java trap for us. And uh, here's, here's how we ended that process. The GNU General Public License is the most popular and most widely used free software license. The special thing about this license is that it's a copyleft license. That is to say, all versions of the program must carry the same license. So the freedoms that the GNU GPL gives to the users must reach all the users of the program. And that's the purpose for which I wrote it. It'll be very good that the Java trap won't exist anymore. It'll be a thing of the past. That kind of problem can still exist in other areas, but it won't exist for Java anymore. I think Sun has, well, with this contribution, has contributed more than any other company to the free software community in the form of software. And it shows leadership. It's an example I hope others will follow. So we started 2004 being denounced by the Free Software Foundation and Grog Law. And in 2006, we launched Open Source Java with a promotional video from Richard Stallman. So how do you convince your organization to embrace this kind of radical culture change. It's not, you can't start with something like the open source Java FAQ. You have to start much smaller. And that's what we did. We had a pilot that was a different license that was uh, related to Java that we uh, used to get the, uh, the Debian community to ship Java binaries. And we camped out on the Debian legal uh, mailing list for quite some time answering questions and we had a, an FAQ that Debian uh, used to better understand what we were doing and it really worked and that proved that this technique uh, was effective. The other thing we did was we very methodically introduced the top leadership at Sun to top leaders in the free and open source uh, software world. We had a series of events we had some dinners, we had some meetings, and they got to know each other face to face and got to develop that trust. And it's much harder to throw rocks at people if uh, you know them. Um, so um, with that, um, this is uh, some resources. There's, I wrote a thing called the FAQ FAQ, which is just what it sounds like. Uh, the Open Java FAQ uh, was archived by the ICT project. Uh, and Android, Creative Commons, and Apache all have FAQs that follow a similar uh, approach to what we're talking about. That's so it. with that, we're done. We're done.